Welcome to chapter three of Soil Science and Management. Today we're going to discuss uh, soil classification and surveying uh, soil and understanding uh, the different uh, parts of soil and, and, and how we classify different soils for uh, suitability and, uh, and, and based upon uses. Uh, the objective of this chapter is to be able to understand and describe the USDA soil classification system. You're going to be able to understand how soil surveys are used and prepared. And we're going to discuss the uh, land capability classes for the soils as defined by the uh, soil uh, conservation standards. <clears throat> So when we talk about soil classification, this is when we're going to, to start to group soils. We talked about this a little bit in previous lectures and understanding um, where these soils have come from and some of their key traits, uh, unique characteristics and, and understanding how they are used and how they can be um, uh, some of the limitations that these soils will, uh, will encounter. <clears throat> When we uh, classify these these soils, we can then compare them uh, to other soils, and we can understand how we uh, need to maybe address issues, or we can uh, start to develop best management practices for uh, dealing with certain soils and their issues. Uh, so the USDA or the United States Department of Agriculture uh, developed a systematic approach to organize these soils and they have put together a, a, a system to classify soils so that it is universally understood as to how to deal with them. So uh, soil taxonomy, this is going to be uh, talking about basically getting down to the root level of understanding different uh, soils, different uh, parts of soils. This is gonna be extremely similar <coughs> to uh, plant taxonomy and uh, 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 like like uh, animal taxonomy. So we're going to talk about uh, soil order, and this is going to be the biggest uh, category. And then those soil orders are further divided down into suborders, and uh, those are divided into uh, great groups, subgroups, and families. And then finally, the families are divided into a soil series. And that soil series is the smallest or uh, most uh, compact version of the soil. So it's going to have uh, the most similarities if we get down to that level. Uh, <clears throat> like I said, the soil series has the narrowest range of features. It is the lowest uh, official category in soil taxonomy. Uh, this is the most uh, useful soil designation because we will understand the soil the best and we'll have the most information, the most data about a soil when we're speaking to it in this, uh, this soil series designation. It also can be uh, divided into phases and uh, this isn't always um, um, done, but in some cases they do want to divide these even smaller as they get into other like sources of soil. So, <clears throat> Here are the soil orders, and, and you know, if I mispronounce any of these words, uh, uh, you know, please forgive me. Don't correct me based on my speech. I I don't would never correct any of you based on your speech. But so the first one is the alpha soles, and this is going to come from deciduous forests in temperate and moist clients, uh, climates. Excuse me. Uh, so remember, deciduous; those are the trees that are losing their leaves. So these alpha soles are going to have um, a lot of, of, of organic material. They're going to be uh, lots of topsoil, lots of really good soil in the top. Um, the andesols, these are uh, formed from recent geologic volcanic materials. So this is gonna be your pumices, your uh, sands, your granites, things like that. It's not your granites, excuse me, your limestones, things like that. Uh, then we have the artisols. This is going to become from arid, arid climates. 
and of cool to hot deserts. So these are going to be, uh, I live in the middle of the Mojave Desert, so I'm quite familiar with these. These are, you know, sandy soils. There, there's not a lot of organic material, not a lot of nutrients. Those are, those are what we're going to be dealing with with the ar aridosols. Then the entosols, and these lack, these lack well developed horizons and the gelosols, very cold soils of the tundra. Uh, histosols or uh, uh, sol uh, soils that contain uh, a lot of decaying organic matter. Uh, these are going to be in your swamplands, wetlands. Uh, these are going to, uh, you know, be your your uh, darker, maybe smellier soils. Um, inceptosols, those are young but more developed than entosols. So when we're talking about uh, young soils uh, and they lack horizons. Um, if a soil hasn't had time to age and hasn't had time to develop the, the different um, A, E, um, O, C, B layers, then, it, then it's going to be considered a young soil. And this happens when uh, either you have a shallow uh, bedrock or you have a lot of movement of the topsoil where constant uh, erosion is taking place. Um, Molasols, these are the probably the best growing soils. Soils. These are going to be the rich, dark soils from the grasslands. They're going to have lots of materials that are uh, are going to be great for growing in, and they're going to be really good for uh, you know people who have uh, uh, farmland or want to take this and turn this into farmland. These are going to be where you're going to get the best bang for your buck. The oxisols. These are the uh, highly weathered soils in the tropics. These are very rare soils. Uh, we do not see these here in the United States uh, because they are more for the, I would say, rainforest areas, the areas in between uh, the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, and those are, are further south than the United States lies. We also have the uh, spotosols. This is going to come from coniferous forests in cool or moist regions. So this is going to come further north. Uh, maybe like the Montanas or the Redwood areas. These are going to be uh, soils that still have quite a bit of organic material, but uh, when you are discussing coniferous forests, uh, the organic material takes uh, longer to break down when you're dealing with needles and, and uh, uh, those types of, of organic material. So it's not as readily available as say a deciduous forest. And, and also, if you remember, most coniferous trees are evergreen, so they aren't losing nearly as much organic material in these areas. You also have uh, altosols, and this is another uh, highly weathered old soil, and these are going to be from the warm and humid climates. Um, the altosols are also great to grow in because they've been weathered. They are defined horizons. They have lots of organic material. They are a strong soil for uh, for using in uh, you know plants or, or, or agriculture, and then uh, the last, I believe this last one is the vertisols. That's the parent materials where they're very high in clays, and um, these are uh, when it says they shrink and swell with drying and wetting cycles. If you've ever seen the bottom of a, uh, a dry lake bed and you uh, see the heavy big cracks in and they're almost like the uh, the polygon uh, shapes of soil that are left. Those are are vertisols, and those are are areas where when they're wet, they um, they are very smooth, they're very silky, and when they dry, they uh, they shrink and create those big heavy duty cracks. So <clears throat> when we talk about the soil survey, we're going to take a look at all these different soils, and we're going to be able to map them and understand uh, where all these different uh, varieties of soils are, are, are appearing and they're available. And, and this can then be used when we're talking about um, uh, like building on certain soils. There are certain soils that are not uh, strong building materials and you want to avoid them when you're, you're building maybe say a big building because they have a tendency to shift or, or become liquid uh, with just a little bit of water. And, and we don't like uh, liquid soils because then your building tends to want to move. And when we put a building in one spot, we don't want that to move. 
Uh, we're going to map all these soils and uh, some of the technology that is used. And uh, if I can make any recommendation, it's it's supplement this education that you're getting in this department with a couple of GPS and GIS classes and even the remote sensing. These these are uh, mapping technologies and and GPS is you know understanding uh, uh, maps and where things are and then GIS is using those maps to uh, understand a specific data set. So uh, if we're understanding where these soils are and how they're utilized, um, we can map them out on on a on a uh, on a map, and we'll be able to uh, put those different uh, sections of soil to the best use possible. And this is all done through GIS, and and it's pinpointing the accuracy of those different. Uh, 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 soils. So uh, things that are involved in a soil survey, you have uh, various reports. So you're going to have your taxonomy, which includes your descriptions and your properties of the soil. You're going to then come into uh, suitability for development. So what is that soil good for? Is it is it good for growing plants? Is it good for maybe a housing development? Is it good for, uh, you know, a rangeland? Should we leave it the way it is? Keep it as a forest? Uh, what, what are we going to do with the soil? Then we start to rate the soil, and we're understanding what's already there. Again, where are we? Is this good for forests? Is this is this going to be cropland? Are we going to leave it for wildlife? Um, and then after all that is done, we're going to take those those survey reports, and we're going to have uh, these soil maps, and those are going to go to the growers and the civil engineers, and they're going to decide what areas we want to use these different uh, these different types of soil so that we don't get, like I said, the liquid soils, we don't want to give those to the civil engineers, and we don't want to give the good building soils to the growers because then we're defeating the purposes of everything that we're trying to do, and, and that would just be bad all around. So <clears throat> when we talk about land capability classes, there are, uh, there are eight classes, and I'm going to read uh, the classes as they're defined by the NR, uh, uh, NCRCD and uh, NRCS. So the NRCS is the uh, National Resource Conser National Resource Conservation Service, um, and they are a group that works uh, heavily with agricultural uh, communities and with uh, understanding uh, soil conservation and how we can do the best uh, things for each different class of soil. So, <clears throat> class one: these are soils that have slight limitations that restrict their use. Uh, class two, soils that have moderate limitations that reduce the choice of plants or require moderate conservation practices. So when we start to talk about these conservation practices, it, this is like uh, certain activities are not recommended in these areas. So uh, what you saw was class one has very limited uh, restrictions, so almost no restrictions. But we get into class two and we already have some issues with this soil where we have to start to understand it and start to make sure we're not going to use it the wrong way. And we have to uh, ensure that these are cons conserved and, and are not going to be uh, used improperly. Uh, class three soils, these have severe limitations that reduce the choice of plants or require special conservation practices or both. So there you go. We are now getting into even severe limitations and we have to be careful with the plants and we have to be careful with how we conserve this soil. Uh, class four soils have very severe limitations that restrict the choice of plants or require very careful management or both. So here we go, very severe with class four. So that's that we're starting to get into the, the higher and more and more we're gonna have to start to conserve these soils and make sure we're using them the correct way. Soil five, soil five soils have little or no hazard of erosion, but have other limitations. Impractical to remove that limit, they're mainly, they're used mainly to pasture land, forest land, or wildlife food and cover. So now we're getting into the soils where, uh, so class one, two, three, four, we have options, we can do certain things. Class five is basically recommended that this is going to be left as rangeland, and it has a, uh, uh, limits and we're we're basically seeing that we could have problems in the future and so we're saying just leave them the way they are. Uh, class six have severe limitations 
that make them generally unsuited to cultivation and that limit their use mainly to pasture, range, forest land, or wildlife food and cover. So there you go, you see, now we're basically saying that uh, you, you really can't cultivate this land, it's not gonna be good, and we're just gonna wanna keep some sort of a cover on that. Uh, and what ends up happening here is the reason we wanna keep cover on these plants or these soils is so that they don't erode themselves and we don't have another dust bowl issue. Uh, class six, these soils have severe limitations that make them generally unsuited to cultivation. Oh, I'm sorry, I just read six. Let me go on to seven. Uh, soils that have very severe limitations that make them unsuitable to cultivation and that restrict their use mainly to grazing, forest land, and wildlife. So again, these uh, <clears throat> five, six, and seven uh, are, are going to be, uh, let's stick them in the rangeland, let's not disturb them, let's leave them alone. Class eight soils, uh, soils are mi and miscellaneous areas have limitations that preclude their use for commercial plant production and limit their use to recreation, wildlife, or water supply, or for aesthetic purposes. So basically this class eight, this is kind of the catch-all. It's the one that doesn't utilize, you can't utilize it for anything. It's there, but we got to really be careful and we want to conserve it. We don't want to mess with it. We don't want to have anything bad happen with this soil. Now, these capability classes can be broken down into subclasses. So there are a subclass E, there's subclass W, subclass S, and subclass C. So uh, let me see if the PowerPoint goes into it. So again, like I said, all these classes except class one have certain limitations, and, and then we add in that single letter code to, to the subclass. So I will go over the subclasses just so we have them. So subclass E, this is made up for soils for which the susceptibility to erosion is the dominant problem or hazard affecting their use. Erosion, susceptibility, and past erosion damage are the major soil factors that affect soil in this subclass. So th there you go. This is going to be something where erosion is an issue. We have to make sure we're conserving and understanding how the soil will be eroded away. Subclass W is made up of soils for which excess water is uh, the dormant hazard or limitation affecting their use. Poor soil drainage, wetness, a high water table, and overflow are the factors that affect soils in the subclass. So I don't know if you noticed that, but subclass E was erosion, subclass W, water. Those are the, 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 the key factors there. So these are all going to have a, you know, a special letter that you're going to understand a little better. So this subclass W, it's going to be those soils that, that have uh, this water issue and, and there's nothing more uh, detrimental to growing plants than say a high water table because if your soil is not going to drain and you have this high water table then the roots start to get choked out and and there's a big problem uh, one of the issues we're facing here in my in my uh, service area is we have done so good at managing our water levels we are actually having alfalfa crops that are uh, dying off because there's a uh, a, a, a water table, our, our, our groundwater table has up uh, past, uh, up close to five feet to the surface, and uh, the soil uh, it, down there is saturated, and the alfalfa wants to grow into that saturated soil, and it just can't because there's no oxygen available for the plants. Okay, so subclass S, this is made up of soils that have soil limitations within the rooting zone, such as shallowness of the rooting zone, stones, low moisture holding capacity, low fertility, that is difficult to wreck in salinity or sodium content. So these are going to be uh, uh, soils that have uh, various issues. And, and I have dealt with some of these soils uh, that have, you know, small um, uh, soil layers. And it's, it's, it is frustrating to deal with them. Uh, uh, so, so just understand that. Uh, and class C is made up of soils for which the climate, the temperature or lack of moisture is the major hazard for limitation, limitation affecting their use. So this is probably going to be your arid soils, soils that are in the desert, soil that are lacking moisture, soil that are lacking structure because they lack the moisture that's, that is required. Okay, so uh, the United States has a great deal of farmland, but you know, it's not uh, evenly distributed. Uh, the Corn Belt, which would be Iowa and uh, Missouri and uh, Nebraska, those are all areas where uh, you know, there's lots of corn grown. They don't call them the corn huskers of Nebraska for nothing. So just understand that there's a lot of really great farmland in that in that area. 
and, uh, and if you want to bring it to California, like I discussed earlier in lectures, the uh, the California Bay Delta has a great deal of great farmland in it as well. So in summary, this, this chapter is again a little bit of a quick one, but uh, we did go over soil surveys and understanding soil classification and, uh, and how soil taxonomy works. And then again, understanding those capability classes is important. Uh, those are going to be the most important thing from this chapter. So please make sure that you look those up and understand those for the tests. Okay, that's a little bit of a hint there for you. I hope to like to give those uh, those lecture hints so that you know what uh, what I'm focusing on and what would be important for you to focus on as well. So thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed the lecture. <laughs>